for they sowed the wind, and they shall now reap the whirlwind. If there was one way to break Nazi Germany's economic back without a costly ground offensive, it seemed the way to go was air power, releasing thousands upon thousands of bombs over the German cities. But wait, what if there was another way? What if someone developed a new kind of bomb, one that could disrupt the enemy's industry with a single decapitating strike, something like a rotating, bouncing sphere that skipped its way over the water's surface to destroy his dams? I'm Indy Nidell. This is a World War II special episode. See, in the May 21st regular episode, I talked about the dam buster raids against German dams, but I did not talk about what led up to them. So here goes. February 4th, 1943, a new directive concerning the bombing war against Germany comes from the Combined Chiefs of Staff. It states, your prime objective will be the progressive destruction and dislocation of the German military, industrial, and economic system, and the undermining of the morale of the German people to a point where their capacity for armed resistance is fatally weakened. One man in British Bomber Command sees this directive as a ringing endorsement for his strategy, so Arthur Harris looks again over the map of the German Reich. There are a variety of targets to choose from, the Luftwaffe's aircraft industry, the Kriegsmarine's U-boat construction sites, the Army's transportation networks, but the most tempting target seems to be the enemy's war industry as a whole. With an ever-increasing number of British heavy bombers at his disposal, outfitted with the latest navigational aids, Harris pictures the future of Germany's major industrial cities as smoke and ruins. Yet his vision for 1,000 heavy bomber all-out offensives is still not really feasible. Precious resources are being diverted all the time, to the Battle of the Atlantic, to the war in the Far East, to North Africa. At the beginning of the year, Harris's bomber command counts just over 500 aircraft, and those of many different types. Not much more than 300 are heavies, the four-engine bombers like the Halifax, Sterling, and Lancaster. The Lancaster is Harris's new favorite. Powered by four Rolls-Royce Merlin engines, it can carry a large number of lightweight bombs and incendiaries, but can also carry huge bombs, some 5,000 kilos of weight with enormous potential for destruction. The German Dornier 17s and Heinkel 111s only carried a fraction of that load during the Blitz. With the Lancaster, Harris thinks he can bomb Germany either into submission or destruction, whichever comes first, if he has enough of them. But one man is to challenge the almighty air marshal at his own game, Barnes Wallace. Wallace was assistant chief designer at Vickers Aviation and is credited as the inventor of many impressive technologies such as the geodetic airframe. He's a well-known and respected aircraft designer who worked alongside Rex Pearson on the Wellington and the new Windsor bomber. Wallace and Harris do not differ that much on principle. Both agree the major weapon to bring Nazi Germany to its knees is air power. It seems the only way to prevent a grinding, brutal land war of attrition. However, while Harris wants to destroy the German industries by bombing the hell out of factories and cities, Wallace does not. In fact, he feels Harris's approach is fundamentally flawed. Wallace thinks the industrial plants and factories in areas like the Ruhr are simply too dispersed. Instead of them, they should focus on taking out Germany's power sources, its coal mines, oil depots, hydroelectric stations, and water supplies. Once power runs out, there is no more war industry. If strength rests in dispersal, then concentration is weakness, Wallace argues. Disruption, rather than destruction, would lead to victory. Because factories and power plants can be spread out, but natural resources cannot. So Wallace goes around with a film reel, showing off his newest prototype to military men, professors, and scientific advisors. The reel shows a Wellington bomber dropping a spherically shaped bomb from a height of around just 20 meters into a stream of water. As the bomb is released, the wooden sphere begins visibly spinning in the air. Once it hits the water, it does not break or explode on impact, but instead propels itself forward, spinning, then bouncing, then spinning again, once, twice, again and again, until the bomb has traveled more than a kilometer and then explodes. People are astonished by this. What is this new weapon? 
What, what are the possibilities of this new bomb that can travel so far horizontally before exploding? Military men, especially from the Navy, are impressed and immediately realize that this bomb can skip right across protective torpedo nets. This is maybe a way to get at the high-profile German ships hiding in the Norwegian fjords. But Wallace wants his bomb to be aimed at the heart of Germany's industry, the Ruhr. There are several promising dams along the river Ruhr, with Myrne being the largest, but there's also Lister, Ennepe, Sorpe, and Henne dams. Together, they hold back some 254 million cubic meters of water, the white coal of Germany. Their destruction would cause huge mayhem and would be a strong blow to German morale, but most importantly, it would severely disrupt their heavy industry. They estimate that the ensuing breach and flood would impede the water supply for 5 million Germans and deny their industries much needed electricity. To get his idea off the drawing board and into production, Wallace tours the big names of British high command, trying to prove the feasibility of his new wonder weapon, though in two variants. One is codenamed Highball. It's a smaller version than his actual dam buster. About 70 centimeters wide, Highball is to be dropped by mosquito bombers, and the Navy could maybe use Highball against the battleship Tirpitz or the ships of the Japanese Navy in the Far East. The other variant is larger and codenamed Upkeep. One and a half meters wide, Upkeep is to be carried by low-flying heavy bombers that would swoop in over German and Italian dams like, like the Möhne or the Tirso ones. Once the rotating bomb is released, it will bounce off the water surface as designed. Over and over again, it skips forward, hopping over the protective torpedo net before bouncing against the dam wall. Then, Wallace envisions, it will sink beneath the surface and will detonate. The explosion will cause a seismic breach within the dam, followed by millions of cubic tons of water flowing through the breach. The flood will wreak havoc in its wake, ultimately destroying the German infrastructure and denying them the use of the reservoir for their industrial needs. Wallace has designed his bomb with a double skin, an inner canister containing a charge and an outer layer with additional explosives, but a layer of air. Kept in place by wooden struts, the rest is simply physics. The trick is to hit the water with an angle of incidence of less than 7 degrees. Then the projectile will not sink, but will ricochet off the surface. This is actually nothing new. Already back in the 17th century, gunners of the Royal Navy skipped cannonballs across the water's surface to increase their reach. To get more accurate results, Wallace purchased a 35-foot-high gravity dam in the Ilan Valley in Wales. This is a little smaller than the Mona and Eder dams, yet quite similar in construction. Wallace is still dissatisfied. Many charges do detonate underwater and damage the dam all right, but damaging is not the same as destroying. They have to exactly judge the right amount of explosives and set the time to make upkeep explode like, like a massive depth charge. Then, with the pressure of the water behind it, the dam would be torn apart by the extending force. By the beginning of 1943, Wallace has the correct size charge. His latest bombs are able to bounce up to 20 times, rotating at something between 425 and 450 revolutions per minute. They can achieve a distance of up to 1300 meters. However, there are still some major doubts. First, for upkeep to work, Wallace needs unprecedented accuracy. RAF Command only sanctions bombing runs at night, with bombing heights of more than 18,000 feet, 5486 meters. If a bomber crew does manage to drop their bombs within a mile of the target, they consider that accurate. Upkeep needs to be dropped at much, much lower altitudes to get the accuracy necessary. And Wallace is running out of time. To effectively breach the dam, the bouncing bomb needs strong water pressure behind its explosion, meaning that the reservoirs must be full. But that happens only during May and June, just a couple months away. And he also needs Harris's best men and equipment. Attacking the Ruhr means asking the bomber crew of a Lancaster to fly through the most heavily defended area in Germany, then drop a bomb with pinpoint accuracy into a small river, and then make it all the way back. Harris has been unaware of Wallace's experiments and the development of upkeep, but when he learns of upkeep being almost ready for delivery, his reaction is predictable. He is fundamentally opposed to it. 
This is tripe of the wildest description. There are so many ifs and buts that there is not the smallest chance of it working. The ensuing controversy causes quite the rift in British High Command. Two sides emerge across air crews and desk jockeys, with people rallying behind either Harris or Wallace. The skeptics in Harris's camp have a point. It is extremely risky to get a bomber crew, even well-trained and outfitted with the newest equipment the RAF has to offer, into one of the best defended parts of Germany. Not only that, but to expect them to drop a bomb into a river with that pinpoint accuracy. Why divert resources right at this time as well, when Harris's all-out bomber offensive is becoming more of a possible reality? Why not keep continuing down the path they already started on and keep perfecting that? Those diversions could prolong the war and might even hurt Britain if they failed. Factions emerge, characters clash, and old interdepartmental rivalries are renewed. Yet in the end, Wallace wins. High Command makes the final decision to modify 30 Lancasters for a low-level, precision attack on the German dams. The new bouncing bomb is finally greenlit. If Harris's rage over this decision could be weaponized, it might be enough to break the dams on its own. Yet, Wallace gets his way. Now it is time to see if his new wonder weapon is up for the task. If all that experimenting has been worth it. Well, as we know, there was only one Dam Buster raid, which you can check out in the regular series and on our Instagram day-by-day -day coverage of the war if you missed it. And there is even more coverage of the raid in the War Against Humanity series, which highlights the fact that another kind of bombing, earthquake bombing, of which Wallace is a proponent, gains a new one in Harris after the Dam Buster experiment. That stuff is all about the actual raid. Today was just a little background into the R&D behind it and an interesting look behind the scenes into the goings-on at Bomber Command. I think episodes like this are important to flesh out aspects of the war that we can't cover elsewhere, and it is very much financed by the Time Ghost Army. So for more of this stuff, join the army at timeghost.tv or patreon.com and check out this special on the Lancaster. It too is super interesting and is also financed by the Time Ghost Army. See you next time. Thank you.